Hello everybody and welcome to New Directions East Asia 2021. This session is entitled Repeated Test Taking and Mobile Technology. The presenter is Professor Anthony Green. He's Professor of Language Assessment and Deputy Director for Research in English Language Learning and Assessment at the University of Bedfordshire, UK. He has published widely on language assessment issues and his recent book, Exploring Language Assessment and Testing, provides an accessible introduction to the field for teachers and students. If you have any questions for uh, Professor Green, please type them into the chat box uh, at any time during the session. We will have 10 minutes at the end where we can address these questions and have a short discussion. I will now hand over to Professor Green uh, and stop sharing my screen. Uh, Professor Green, please start sharing your screen and begin when you're ready. Thanks very much. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Yep, so how can, many times, sorry? I was just gonna say, I can hear you, see you, and I can see your slides, so we're all good. Great, thank you. How many times would you retake a test if you had the chance? So if you could take an English test as often as you wanted over the course of a day, a week, a year, how many times would you do it? In this session, we're going to look at how many times people did when they had the chance. And you may be surprised at how often they did that. But first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about the test itself. So the test I'm talking about is called English Score. And what's innovative about this is that it's delivered using mobile phones. So you can take the test literally anywhere at your convenience, as long as you have access to a mobile phone. And the good news is that it's free to take. It's based on a test that was developed about 10 years ago by the British Council called the ILA. And it's a sort of evolution from that test over time. It's intended for young adult and adult users of English anywhere around the world. It's available now in over 150 different countries. Um, it's been in operation now for the best part of two years. As I say, it's administered using a mobile phone. It's also proctored using a mobile phone. And I'll say a little bit more about how that's done later. And because it's free to access and because it gives quick results, it, comes over, it overcomes a lot of the barriers that we've had to English testing. So it's fairer from the point of view that anybody can access it as long as they have access to a mobile phone, which would mean more or less anybody around the world, or at least in this, area, in, in this region. Um, and because it's free, obviously, it doesn't cost them anything to take it. So easy to, um, to access the test. It's available international. Um, it covers um, areas from it's, the, the design is based on the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, which sets out four domains for language use, the personal, the public, the occupational and the educational. It doesn't focus so much on the educational domain. It's not a test that sits within um, a language curriculum. It's intended for more the workplace and for everyday life. So it focuses on the personal, the public and the occupational domains. And as you go through the test, sort of as you go up through the levels, it moves more from the personal, so the lowest level test takers are able to talk about themselves and their immediate environment, up to the higher levels where it's more concerned with occupational, the workplace domain, where people can talk about their jobs and be involved in, in workplace activities. It's made up of three sections at the moment. Um, there's a grammar and vocabulary section, um, a reading section and a listening section. So within the Common European Framework of Reference, we're thinking of reception activities. So being able to read or listen to written or spoken language and grammatical accuracy and vocabulary range for, and control competencies. So mastery, knowledge of the grammar and the vocabulary of the language. There are plans as the test evolves to add in 
more productive and interactive activities as well, involving written and spoken language. So the, the writing and the speaking element will come, but it hasn't been in place so far at the beginning of the operation of English School. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the test itself first, um, looking at the grammar and vocabulary. All sections of English score at the moment involve selecting the correct answer from a set of choices, and they're all three option. So three option, multiple choice questions throughout. Depending on your performance on the grammar and vocabulary section, you get directed to different sets of reading and listening material. So we get a sense of the level of the test taker from their grammar and vocabulary performance. And then we direct them towards the most appropriate reading and the most appropriate listening um, level material. So it's partially adaptive. Um, it ranges from the A2 level up to the C1 level. So material is um, designed to test at these different levels of the common European framework. So in grammar and vocabulary, it ranges from simple grammatical structures and sentence patterns and very routine everyday kind of vocabulary set in familiar situations using familiar topics up to a wider range of more complex grammatical structures at the higher levels with broad range of vocabulary, including more idiomatic language and colloquialisms as you'd expect of higher level language learners. But it's intended to be international varieties of English accessible to people all around the world. And here's a couple of examples from the, the grammar and vocabulary test, one more grammar focused item, one more vocabulary focused item. Let me give you an idea of how it appears on the screen. With the reading and listening tests, then these are separate tests. The grammar and vocabulary section has 48 items. The reading and listening sections have 24, item, 24 items each. Um, both of them work in a similar way. So at the lower levels, we're more focused on whether they can understand the individual words in the text or in the recording that they're listening to. And it's connected with um, decoding those uh, words recognizing the words and, and how they fit together. So simple parsing at the lower levels. As we move up to the higher levels, we get into more complex parsing um, and putting ideas together from parts of a text or parts of a re recording to build an overall understanding of what's being said or what's being written. So the range goes from short, incomplete texts where the, the test taker has to provide um, a suitable phrase or clause to, to complete a section of text at the lower levels, up to reading more complex texts and answering questions about that text at the, the higher, the C1 level. And in listening, we're going from listening for very specific information to identify the point, main points. And then as we get up to the higher levels, inferring meanings and extracting relevant information from longer, more complex sequences of, of speech. And here's a couple of examples from the reading and listening test. So I mentioned that something about how the, the test is proctored online using the mobile device. Um, so when the, the test taker um, takes the test, they have to appear on camera um, to identify themselves. And as the test goes on, they're monitored through the test to make sure that they continue to be um, fully visible on screen throughout the test. So we can recognize it's the same person, nobody else is appearing within the screen. And we monitor their performance to make sure that they're not in some way trying to, to cheat the test. Then results are reported um, in a variety of forms. So they get an overall score and they're given an indication of how well they've performed relative to other people who take the test and a report that gives them details of how they've performed on each section. So that gives you some idea of what the test is like um, and how the test experience might be for the test taker. Let's focus then on repeated test taking. 
because this is a free test, um, there's no restriction, uh, there hasn't been any restriction in the first year of operation on how many times people can retake it. We have now re actually introduced some restrictions, so people cannot take the test more than twice within 24 hours, and they can't take it more than 10 times within a period of 28 days. But during the first year of operation, there was no restriction. So that can give us an idea of how often people would like to retake the test and what sort of behavior they invo that is involved when they do retake the test. So let's have a look at how people behave. So over the first year, the, the, as I say, this is now in the second year of operation. Now we now have about uh, or over 2 million people taking the test every year, available in over 150 countries. So we took a sample of 1 million test takers from this first year of operation, and we looked at their repeat test taking behaviors. First of all, around 14% of all test takers retook the test, which means that about a quarter of all the the tests that were delivered were retakes, people taking for the second or third or fourth or fifth time. 69% of the people who retook the test only did that once. And most of those um, actually did that on the same day. 14% of retakers, so 14% of the people who retook the test did it more than three times. And a maximum number, so the, the highest number of retakes was 252, 252 times within a year. Somebody must have really loved the test. So the largest number of retakes were done on the same day as the first test, and a further 45% of people had their second attempt within 10 days of the first test. In fact, often they took the test a number of times within those 10 days. So most often people retook on the same day. Um, the median was within one day, but the average was 13 days. So there were some people like that person who retook 252 times who retook over quite an extended period of time. And the maximum was 306 days between the first attempt and the last attempt. So how far do people's how far does people's performance change over the period? So here we're just looking at people who've attempted the test 10 times or more. So relatively small number of people um, compared to the overall number of retakers. But you can see there's not a dramatic change in their score. The scale we're looking at here is a rash logit scale, and it ranges from minus four up to around seven. So you can see within that range of possible scores, first of all, the average scores are not varying by much between one and 1.25 on this scale of 11 possible points. Um, and that there's no dramatic change. It doesn't go up dramatically over the, over the time. Um, but as I've said, some of these people are taking, retaking the test within a very short period. So you wouldn't expect to see very dramatic differences. So what happens if we look in a little bit more detail? Here we're looking at people who've retaken the test over a number of weeks. Um, and you can see again that there's not a dramatic shift and actually the average score is lower at the end of 40 weeks than it was at the beginning of 40 weeks. But I should be clear, these are not necessarily the same people retaking on each occasion. We've got the same group, but they're not all retaking every week. They may be retaking five or 10 times within that period. If we look instead at mean scores by the number of attempts. So here we're looking at the same people um, within each group. So people who've attempted twice, three times, four times, up to 16 times um, over a period of 12, uh, not a period, but over 12 attempts at the test. A Couple of interesting things to note here. One is that the more often they retake, 
the higher their starting level tends to be. So it's a slightly higher performing group of people taking the test 16 times than people who are taking the test twice. You can see the people who only take the test a few times, so two, three or four times, they tend to finish on a high. So it suggests that maybe people who are looking for a certain score or looking to improve their score, they tend to stop retaking the test when they have got a slightly higher score than when they started. Although it's also true to say that the second attempt tends to be a higher score than the first attempt. So there is a very small practice effect apparently here. So people who take the test the second time tend to do slightly better than they did on the first occasion, but only slightly. You can also see that there's not dramatic difference between the final attempt and the first attempt for most people. So we're not seeing big improvements in school. It suggests people are not learning very much in between their first attempt and their last attempt, which, as I say, given that most of these attempts are within a fairly short time period, is what we'd hope to see. If we compare people in different countries, again, we're seeing this very sort of flat line between the first attempt and the second attempt. Um, I, the figures you can see in brackets there, the percentages are for um, people taking the, the test the third time. Um, so that's the percentage of people who go on after taking the test twice to take it on a third occasion. And that probably accounts for the slightly different results that we see, that it's not that their performance is dramatically different, but that we're looking at a slightly different group of people or a smaller group of people than the total. And that smaller group of people tends across countries to be slightly higher performers than the ones who've only taken it twice. So looking at the data, I found there were generally three different kinds of people retaking the test. There seemed to be three different patterns of results. The first one we'll look at is someone who's taken the test over a period of about three months. And we're looking here at the range of scores that they obtain. So on average, they were scoring 1.33. They tried the test 30 times. And generally, you can see that they were scoring more or less the same. So you can see those 11 attempts all very close to their mean score. If we look at how that pans out in terms of their performance over time, it appears this is someone who is doing some learning over those three months. So on average, we can see that their score improves, but it's quite variable. So on um, around day 50, you can see that they have a score that is actually a little lower than their, their third attempt at the test after just one day. Um, but you can see that they end up um, around day 89 to 91 at a higher point. They're now up to around 1.5, going up from their starting point, which was a low below 0 0.5. So they seem to be gaining and improving as they go along. If we map the mean, their mean score, we can see that their performance relatively was below the mean when they began, and it's gone up to above the mean at the point where they finish. And if we fit a line, we can see that the trend is for their score to improve over the period. But because we've got this variability, we can see that individual score points don't necessarily represent their apparent ability, particularly accurately over time. So it may be better to take an average of, say, three performances at a time. So here we've got a moving average, which takes their last three test scores and averages them. And we can see that if we use this moving average as an indicator of how well they perform, that's much closer to this underlying trend, the straight line, than if we take their individual test scores. So if we're trying to track someone's performance over time and we're getting them to repeatedly take the test, this might be a much better indication of what their real ability is like and be slightly less depressing for them when they get those lower scores than if we um, just treat one shot um, scores as, as an accurate indication of how good they are. 
Looking at the second pattern of results, I'm calling this a scattershot test taker. This is someone who's tried the test a lot of times, 27 times, really over a weekend in four days. So they've done a lot of attempts. They did eight attempts on the first morning, I think another five attempts on the first afternoon, um, and then quite a few more attempts on the second day, one attempt on the third day, and eight more attempts on the final day. We can see they've had a couple of, of good results, um, but most of their results fall within um, this period of um, sort of fall, fall fairly close to the mean. This is a, a relatively high scoring test taker. So you can see their main score is, is close to six compared to those people who are scoring one, that test taker who started off with the 90 days. So the pattern of results for this test taker is relatively flat. They're not ending up at the end of um, those four days with a much higher score than when they began. Um, in fact, there's a significant but very weak relationship between the number of attempts and improvements in their score. If we look at the mean and then we look at the trend, we can see that those two lines are very close together. So you wouldn't really expect someone to improve much over four days, and that's what happens. We see that their results are pretty consistent. Again, if we take a, a moving average rather than taking the individual scores, we eliminate those relatively high and relatively low scores from the results. The third test taker, this is another one who's taken the test a number of times over a long period of time. Here we're looking at someone who's done it 20 times over 235 days. So this is sort of seven or eight months. Again, this is a relatively low scorer. So the mean of one rather than the mean of around six that we saw for the last one. And unfortunately, unlike the first test taker we looked at, this person's performance doesn't change very much over those 235 days. So we can call this a kind of plateau English user. We're not seeing dramatic improvements in their scores over time. Again, we can see there's not huge variation in the scores. So over this 11 point scale, their scores all fall between 0.6 and 1.4, so not a huge difference in their scores over the time. Um, if we fit the line, that's the flat line, that's the trend line, almost no difference between them. So this is someone who, if they're learning, is learning at a very slow pace, but they seem to be maintaining roughly the same level of English over this period. Again, if we fit that moving average, it seems to be a, a better indication of their abilities than simply looking at individual scores, one-shot scores. So what do we take from this? Um, first, we can say that, yes, the kind of testing we're doing here may be fairer in that it gives more people access to being able to take the test. It gives them the opportunity to do it for free. Um, if we do repeated test taking, it can add significantly to the reliability of the results we're able to get. So even if we just take a simple moving average of three attempts on the test, that appears to be a better indication, consistently better indication of somebody's true level of ability than individual test taking events. If we look at individual test taking events, that gives us an inconsistent picture of how much progress people are making over time. The first attempt tends to be relatively slightly weaker than subsequent attempts. So a one shot test taking event may underestimate somebody's ability to use the language. Um, but because we allow people to take the test repeatedly, it gives us a range of different scoring options, one of which might be to use a moving average, or we might use uh, more sophisticated approaches um, where we take the, the information that we can um, have the most trust in. We might decide that we want to reject the first attempt because we think that's likely to be an underestimate and take, um, take second and third attempts as perhaps better indications of how well somebody may be able to perform. Of course, it's greener 
because taking the test on online um, and on your phone doesn't involve you traveling anywhere and it doesn't involve you using up paper and sending things through the post or um, making use of physical infrastructure. And, and stronger, yes, potentially, because it could give us a better indication of how well people are able to perform than those traditional tests. I'll draw to a close there so we still have some time for questions. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Green, for that very uh, insightful session. Uh, we have a couple of uh, questions from the audience. Uh, one question from uh, Trevor Breakspear: Has any student, or oh, sorry, have any student surveys been done so we can link motivation, intention, uh, motivation and intention to improvement? Um, yes. Yeah, so we we do collect. Um or English score collects data on why people are taking the test. So we can see whether they're taking it um, for, for purposes of their job, because they're students, or because they're preparing for a test like IELTS. Um, so we can look at that, yes. Um, it's something I will look at, but it's not part of, of this piece of work. Trevor also asks, um, was the raw score or were the raw score differences explored to tap into the differences between listening and reading? Yes, yeah, so we have, of course, one of the advantages of this being done on mobile phone is that you have data for every, um, every test item. So you can see how long it's taken them to respond to that item. You can see what their response was, which items they, they were given. Of course, that's a huge amount of, of data and it will take us a long time to to work through all the analysis of it, but yeah, we can we can track exactly what their behaviour was as they as they took each test. Thanks. Um, a question from me: um, When you showed the graph of a test taker over a long period of time, and you had um, big uh, amounts of variance, so someone had a real dip in their performance, um, would it be possible to dig into that performance and see what questions they were answering and? Uh, compare that to the other questions that they were asked that got them a high score? Because I'm just interested in, um, in terms of validation, is the variance due to the test taker or is the variance due to the test? Yeah, I mean, I would say, first of all, that what you say is a, a big dip, actually in relative terms is a tiny dip um, because their, their score was not dramatically different on that, that occasion. It's just that the way the graph is presented, we're looking at the range of scores between kind of one and two on a scale from kind of minus four to, to plus seven. So it's it's not a huge difference. But yes, um, we have all that data. You could go um, and look at exactly which questions was were answered by each individual test taker on each occasion. And you could see you know, where, if, if there seemed to be um, particular areas of grammar or vocabulary or particular listening sections where they seem to perform less well. Um, Potentially that's diagnostic information, um, but I'd be fairly cautious about interpreting responses to one or two test questions as telling you too much about somebody's overall ability. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to the end of the session. To those who are watching, please don't forget to leave us some feedback by answering the two short survey questions next to the screen. I would Thanks just as, as one last word, if I, if I may. Um, Work is ongoing on this. If there are any keen postgraduates out there, we will shortly be um, advertising for a, a, a postgrad, a postdoctoral um, researcher to work on this program. Um, so watch this space, please. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for attending, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And for Professor Green, thank you very much once again for a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks.